It is so good to say that every week. And uh, just want to remind you again about the Walk for Life. Uh, I will be there Saturday. And I uh, just want to encourage uh, my fellow brothers and sisters to come and be a part of that. And uh, I know Judy will be out in the hallway. And uh, we have some little cards, uh, sign-up cards that you can get pledges from and, and really help. We've been involved in that ministry a long, long time. As a matter of fact, uh, Clinton Road Baptist Church, remember that church? Uh, we were formerly Clinton Road Baptist Church, now Crosspoint Church. I was one of the first to be involved and one of the longest running and also with the rescue mission, and also with the seminary uh, in Schenectady. So I want to thank you for being a church that is long-term and their commitments to these parachurch groups that uh, very much help us uh, as we serve the Lord. And we thank God for every person. As a matter of fact, the text that I'm going to use this morning to conclude uh, the series of sermons as we have been uh, involved in the Daniel plan, we had the first class today, and it was fantastic. It's uh, not too late. Uh, you're, if your name was on the list and you didn't show up and you're very convicted right now, that's just fine. Uh, but we would like you to be in the class. And so it's not too late. We started today, got off to a great start. I think it's going to be one of the best things we have ever done in the life of our church. Probably one of the most powerful life-changing things that we have, have ever done. And very excited about that. But as I think about uh, life itself and we think about closing out the series of sermons and the uh, the sixth sermon that I will be preaching, I'd like you to take your Bible and turn to Psalm 139. Would you please turn to Psalm 139? I'm going to read it. It's uh, one of the most memorable Psalms that you can read in all of the Scripture. Some of you know already and you have thoughts in your mind because you know the Word of God and you know what the topic is here. But... Uh, the psalmist, uh, the, the songwriter, is reflecting upon his God. He's uh, reflecting around the, the creative uh, genius of God. And then he reflects on what God has made. And one of those things certainly is himself. And he, he understands that. And today the topic is becoming who God meant you to be. Becoming who God meant you to be. You see, you were in God's mind before anybody else's mind. God, you were in his thoughts, in his imagination, before anyone else ever dreamed of you, before you were a twinkle in your father's eye, as they say, or a consideration of your mother's dreams, God had you on his mind. And the psalmist is going to reflect on that, and then today I want to talk about that very subject, how you can become who God envisioned you to be. O oh Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, and you perceive my thoughts from afar. I'd like you to meditate upon that. Today you are seated in this sanctuary. You could join the psalmist in these very words, and they would be true. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord, and you hem me in behind and before. And you have laid your hand upon me, and such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit, and where can I flee from your presence? Notice how the psalmist reflects on these great qualities of God. He's omniscient, he's omnipresent, he's omnipotent. If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, what a beautiful dawn it was this morning. I hope you got up to see it. If I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Talk about intimacy with his God. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for the darkness is as light to you. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And that's one of the reasons why we are a supporter of CareNet and other organizations that stand up for life. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that 
full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. How precious that is to think about. All the days ordained for me. Think about that between you and your God. We're in worship. Think about him. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. He knows your yesterday. He knows your today. He knows your forever. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. God thinks about you. He thinks about me. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you would slay the wicked, O oh God. Away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. And then finally this, and lead me in the way of the everlasting. So the psalmist recognizes who God is and that God is his creator, that God thought of him, that God was there when he was conceived, when he grew, when he was born. He recognized that. And as he thought about his life, he understood his need not only to think about his creator, but to be led by his creator. And the fact is, is that every one of us needs to be led. We will follow something. We will give our hearts to something. But the best thing we can give our hearts to is the Lord God who created us. And we all need to be led. The Bible says we are all like sheep and we go astray. Have you ever noticed that? And so uh, this morning, I'd like us to join with the psalmist and consider some things about ourselves. And the first thing I want to say to you is that Every one of us is, is wonderfully complex. There is nothing that is not complex about a person. If I were to say to you, would you please explain someone? How could you explain Maria? Or how could you explain Sam? Or how could you explain Sue? What depth would you go into to be able to, be able to encompass all of what's in a person? And so we are wonderfully complex. And that means that relationships are complex. They're not easy. Are there any married men in the house today, in God's house today? Would you say that your wife is puzzling at times? Would you say that, uh, I hear statements, I just can't figure her out. I've been married to her 35 years, and I, I still you know, can't figure the woman out. And that fact is, is that God has given us a, a mystery in our wives. Can you say amen to that? And so every uh, individual has complexity. And I want to talk about some factors today that influence your very identity. And many of these factors uh, you can't change. You didn't ask for them but they are a part and parcel of your life. And so we're going to look at those five factors today, and then we're going to look at something that God has given you that no matter about these factors, you can change your life for the better and become the person that God wants you to be. And you should be very interested in who God wants you to be. Many of us spend much of our life pursuing who we think someone else wants us to be or who may be in our mind who we think that we ought to be. And I want you to know we go down a lot of blind alleys and a lot of dead ends and we wander around for a very long time. And so maybe we should be very concerned and open even this morning as God, since you created me, and I am here to bring you glory and honor and praise. How many of you love the music this morning that led us to that place of contemplation? <laughs> praise God for that. But God, who do you want me to be? And uh, so some factors I want us to consider this morning are, are, are these. 
Uh, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. There's no one like you, never been an individual exactly like you. Uh, no one is going to have uh, your exact uh, uh, components that made you up, your history, uh, those kind of things. And so you are wonderfully very, very complex. And so here's some factors that influence your very identity. First of all, your chemistry. Your chemistry. And what, what do I mean by that? Uh, the fact is that you have DNA. And when I talk about your genes, I'm not talking about whether it's Levi or Wranglers this morning. I'm talking about the genetic makeup of who you are. And each of us has uh, individual kind of chemistry, if you will. As a matter of fact, there are some of you here that you have a very high tolerance to pain. But you may be sitting next to a person who doesn't have a very high tolerance to pain. Now guess who gets married? Does anybody know? The person with a very high tolerance to pain gets married to what? A person usually with a very low tolerance of pain. And what does the person with a high tolerance of pain think about the person that has a low tolerance of pain? Well, you're just a crybaby. Why don't you, you, you get sick, you come in and you're cut, put a Band-Aid on it, you know, no big deal, that kind of thing. What are you so excited about? And so some of you were born with a high tolerance to pain, but others, uh, I mean, you... You just, it, it, pain hurts you, and it's real, and you're, you can't change that. There, there's not anything you can do. Some of you have a thyroid problem, and that means that your thyroid doesn't work the way that it should. And by the way, none of us here have perfect bodies. Can you say amen to that? Not such a thing. We live in a broken world. We learned about that this morning in our class. We live in an imperfect world, and everything here is imperfect. I am so sad to break your bubble this morning. But imperfection is all around us, and we live in a world like that. So does everybody's thyroid operate correctly in this world? No, they don't. And so some people here this morning, uh, there are some women... Uh, that when we get to uh, estrogen, it is just not happening and it needs to. And so we're put on supplements and men have similar problems. And so uh, we have people born with predispositions. Now just because you have a predisposition doesn't mean that it has to control your life. Can you say amen to that? And so, uh, there are people that are prone to certain things. Maybe uh, you have a weak skeletal structure, or maybe you have brittle bones because of a lack of something in your body, your DNA. And I, uh, you know, have a son, and I know sometimes he doesn't like the fact, he, he will turn to me and say, boy, I don't like the fact that I have this stomach that seems to give me problems. I got that from, guess who he points to? I got that from you. Guess who I point to? My father. My father had trouble with his stomach. I have trouble with mine. My son, as he got older, has trouble with his stomach. Who does my father point to? It's a part of my hereditary. And so I have some chemistry in my life. And a subject that needs to be talked about in the church that's never talked about in the church is a thing called mental illness. Uh, we have institutions, as a matter of fact, in this area. Have you ever driven down some of the roads in our area? And you can see the old mental hospitals. We used to call them asylums. Do you remember those? Uh, mental illness is something the church really does struggle with. Are there people with mental illness all around us? I know about some of your families, and you tell me about the mental illness that touches your family. And it's very, very real. And uh, there are people that I know and love that are wonderful Christians, but the fact is, is that uh, they have some mental illness issues. And so uh, one of the things that makes you up as a person as you sit here this morning is you have certain chemistry, and it is a part of your identity. If you are a 
diabetic here this morning. Uh, it is an issue that you deal with, and I could talk much more about that, but it is uh, an important thing for you to understand that that does affect who you are. The other thing I would like to say today is not only your chemistry, but your connections. So what in the world are your connections? Uh, we were all born into the Adams family. I told you that before. And uh, you are a member of the Adams family. You, you are. But not only that, you have an immediate family and you have relatives. And in talking with you and in you talking with me, uh, I find out that uh, that can be interesting all in itself. And so uh, you uh, may be born into a very large family. And you had no control over that. You didn't give God direction when you said, no, I really like being, you know, kind of alone. Uh, but you were born into a house that maybe 12 other brothers or sisters. That's got to be an interesting on any morning. You remember the days when every household had one bathroom, if they were lucky? And every household had one car, and you were glad to have a car. And you may have been born into a particular family, and in your family, there may have been some very wonderful things that happened. You may have had a godly father or a godly mother, good examples in your home. But you may have grown up in a, a very, very tough situation. Some of you know what it is to live in poverty. Some of you could tell stories today uh, about as you grew up that there just was no money. And so there were things that you didn't get, and there were things that you had to live without. And you uh, know the value of something. To have a full refrigerator, you would know much more than the person sitting next to you that may, you may consider grew up in a house with a silver spoon, so to speak. Some of you here this morning have grown up in the families where there was health, but some of you grew up in families where there was hurt. I will go on a Baptist Builders trip soon. One of the members that I uh, first met some years ago, and I've been doing this a long time, he shared his testimony for the first time, and it went something like this. When I was eight years old, I can remember in my mind that I was at my grandmother and grandmother's house, and my grandfather, in my presence, shot my grandmother dead, then turned the gun on himself and shot himself. And I remember that very, very vividly. That's how his testimony started. Did he ask for that? No. Did he invite that? Did he want that? No, he didn't. But it is a part of his life. And a lot of things that happened after that as a result of that tragedy affected his life in a lot of different ways. And there are some of you sitting here, you know what it is? To be helped in a home, you know what it is to be hurt in a home. And some of you have suffered abuse and violence. Some of you know what it is to be abandoned. That you tell the story that uh, my dad, when I was very young, walked out, never to come back again. I don't know him, don't know where he lives, and frankly, I don't have a desire to ever connect with him. Don't think that that doesn't affect you as an individual. And maybe he didn't leave home, but mom and dad were kind of emotionally disconnected, and you lived in a home like that. Or you lived in a home where work was your God, and you had relatives that you thought very highly of, and you tried your best to win their approval, but you never could get it. And so you come into the world today with a deficit, and you really believe if you try hard enough, you can win the approval of people. And I want you to know that uh, that is not an easy thing to live with, and those are a part of your connections that you have, and we all have those. And then another thing that makes us to be the people that we are are the very circumstances of our lives. And I don't know what the circumstances of your life uh, were. I don't know uh, how easy or hard it was, what your joys or what your sorrows is, but according to the Scripture, does God know? Yes, he does. He knows the challenges of the circumstances that came your way. That, that accident that happened out of time and so expected and you lost a loved one in an instant. And God is aware and God knows uh, what that 
was, was like. And then the next thing I'd like to share with you that makes you up to be who you are is your very consciousness. And uh, Pastor, what do you mean by consciousness? That, that's, that's kind of the way you... Have you noticed the funny thing about human beings? Human beings talk to themselves. Do you talk to yourself? Please don't lie this morning. Okay? We talk to ourselves and we, we, we talk to ourselves all the time. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, the person you will lie to most in your life is guess who? Is you. Uh, people come across so pious, but not only do we tell lies, we lie to ourselves all the time. Have you ever said uh, to yourself, uh, that would be really good for you, and it really wasn't, and you knew it, and you just lied to yourself uh, with that? And uh, we talk to each other, and I want to ask you this morning, what do you say to yourself? When you talk to yourself, what do you say to yourself? And the fact is you do this constantly and you do it all day. And that self-message is really interesting because it's like watching repeats. Do you remember repeats? Boy, back in the day, we, you know, we used to watch Gunsmoke. How many of you remember Gunsmoke? Remember that? You're dating yourself now, okay? And those things came on, you know, you'd wait until Friday or you wait until 30 for the next episode. How many of you remember Batman? Remember Batman? I mean Batman, you know, and, Rob, and all the corniness that went with it. I'd wait all week long for what? Batman was going to come on and you were going to say, and they always gave you the little glimpse at the end of the show what was going to happen next. Remember the giant clam that was going to eat Batman and Robin? How would they get out of that? And we wait for... Uh, the next uh, week to come. But the fact is, is that when the season was over, what would they begin doing? We call it reruns. Do they have reruns anymore? Yeah. And so, uh, I don't know why we do it. We already watched it. And we already know how it's going to end. Isn't that crazy? But we watch it again. And then not only do we watch it again, we do what? We watch it again. And again, and again. You know, it's interesting that the tape that's in your mind, a lot of times, what, what is it? It's reruns. It's the, it's the same tape over and over and over again. And some of us tell ourselves things like this. Uh, you're homely. Or you're not very smart. Or you'll never amount to anything. Your dad told you that. And you're never going to make this marriage work. You didn't make the last one work. And you're not going to make this one work. As a matter of fact, things are tough right now. You know the doorway. You found it before. And I got to tell you, we got to be careful about our consciousness of what we say to ourselves. You know, some of the things you say to yourself, you would never tell anybody else or never say it to anybody else. And it's very important that we realize that these factors make us who we are. The proverb tells us this. As a man thinks in his heart, does anybody know how it ends? So is he. And that's a lot to think about. And so uh, as we think about these things that make us up, uh, you may have looked at that and say, well, there's good news and there's bad news. But we as human beings tend to gravitate to what? Does anybody notice? We tend to gravitate and dwell upon the bad news. Why? Because we live in a broken world. And one of the things that's broken in this world is us. Can you say amen? And we can't be all that God wants us to be, but God wants us to be all that he imagined us to be. And I want to tell you, his plan for us and what's in his imagination is not for disaster. It's not for doom. It's not. God did not make us for depression. Although your chemistry may be inclined to be that way because you are not producing enough serotonin, because your circumstances are gloomy, God does not want you to live in depression. Isn't that good news this morning? So you may have all these factors and you say, well, there's a lot against me, but I really like what Romans says. If God be for us, who 
can be against us. And the thing I'm going to share with you now that's a part of your identity is very important and very powerful if you use it in the right direction. Are you interested? And this is what it is. My choices. I, I want that to soak into you. There was a fellow, uh, can't remember his name, but it was during uh, the realm and the whole experience of World War II, Nazi Germany. He was captured. He was a Jew. He said, they took me. They took my family away. My business was gone. I ended up in a camp. He said, they even took my clothes away. I truly was robbed of everything I had except for one thing. And that was my choice about how I would respond to all that had happened to me. And that was the thing that kept him sane. And that was the thing that kept him in touch with his God. And that was the thing that got him through those horrible years. And after that, God used him in a tremendous way to help other people come to know this God. You were made in the image of God. Did you know that? And God chooses, and because God has this power to choose, since he's made us in his image, he has given us this great gift of choice. Now, can I use my choices for good? Can I use my choices for evil? Yes, I can. But it is up to me. And how many of you are glad that God has given you the freedom of choice? The freedom to love God or not to love him. The freedom to follow him or not to follow him. And I want to tell you, some people tell me, say, I wish God didn't make us like that. Well, it's nice. Maybe we can arrange a little meeting with you and God. You can inform him and straighten him out on this matter. But the fact is, is that there cannot be love, real love, without there being real choice. And so God has given us choice, and he wants to use us for our good and for his glory. Uh, and it's a wonderful gift, and I'll tell you what it can do. Can my choices overcome my chemistry? Yeah. Yeah. The influence that they have on my life, yeah, they're there, but we're going to talk about the difference that choice can make. Can my choices affect my connections in my relationships? Yeah, they can. Can my choices that God has given me affect my circumstances? Absolutely. Can my choices affect my consciousness? What I think about. Yeah, they can. How many of you are ready to use this great gift that God has given to us so that we can become all the person that God intended us to be? It was your choice to come to church today. How many of you are glad you did so far? <laughs> Praise God. You didn't have to be here. As a matter of fact, if you wanted to stay in bed today, you could have. A big hand from heaven would not have come down, extricated you from your house. Sometimes pastors wish that would happen and put you in the chair where you are. But you came out of a free will, and I hope you came today not to hear from me, but to hear from God, who cares about you and loves you. The words I share with you today are not my own. Somebody else said that. They're the Father's words. Did you know he is far more concerned about you than I am? And he's far more concerned about you than you are about yourself. And God wants the very, very best for you. If you're a parent here this morning, what parent does not want the very best for their child? And so we come today uh, with this great gift of choice. And here's some things I want to say as we, we wrap this up. Here's some, some winning choices. You can take your choices. You can really win. Even though 
you have had some tough circumstances, even though you have some chemistry all you, you, that you don't desire. Also, you have uh, some of the other things we talked about. And here are some things I'd like you to contemplate this morning as you consider. I can choose to get healthier. Is that true or false? It's true. I had a fellow working at uh, my property just yesterday and did a wonderful job. My wife was concerned that he had something to drink and something to eat. So she would go out, because I was working here at the church, go out and offered him something to eat, something to drink. He said, no thanks, I'm good. And he said, I have my Mountain Dew and I have my donuts. <laughs> he started early in the morning and he didn't quit until later in the day. Do you know what he had for breakfast, lunch? Now, I just want to ask you, uh, could he get healthier? Uh, I just want to tell you, Mountain Dew really doesn't come from mountains. <laughs> Did you know that? It doesn't. It doesn't come from mountains. It's not, they don't go out and collect dew. And put it in bottles and say, here's Mountain Dew. And, uh, but I know a lot of kids, I've watched the high schoolers as they go to Westmoreland School and the drive. Guess what you see these kids toting? I'm not talking about a little bottle. I'm talking about a liter of Mountain Dew or Dr. Pepper. Now, folks, I got to tell you, do you think those kids have a choice? Do you think those parents are saying, now when you get to school, you run out of the store, first thing you do is because your energy is going to be low. We want you to get, uh, better than that, get one of those red bulls. And I'm going to tell you what, that's a lot of bull. Can you say amen? Uh, you, you know, they're telling you that stuff's good for you. It's not. It's poison is what you're doing to yourself. And I'm going to say we, we can point fingers and we can laugh, but how many of you ate something this week you shouldn't have eaten? And you could have chose something healthy. Okay. And so you can choose. You can choose. You can use this. Uh, and this is what the scripture says. You made me and you created me. Now give me the sense to follow your commands. Is that a good scripture or what? Get, give me the common sense. Some people say they just lack sense. And I'm just going to tell you, is anything I've shared with you in the last six foot, is, that, is it like, that is so amazing. It is so deep. The pastor must have contemplated that for months before he said that. It's all stuff that we want. It's common sense, and we know to do it. The problem in Romans says what? We know to do right, but we can't do it because we don't have the power. Who can help us? Does anybody know his name? His name is Jesus, and Jesus can help us to make the right choices. And by the, by the way, he's helped you to do that in a lot of other areas in your life. Some of you used to be really stupid with your money. I'm sorry I said that. Um, is stupidity a biblical word? They talk about the fool in Scripture. They talk about it a lot. Are we foolish sometimes? You used to be foolish with your money, but not so anymore. Now, it may have taken some hard circumstances, and aren't you glad that God walks with you through the hard circumstances and the good circumstances? And when you bury yourself, in a pit of debt, and you don't know how you're going to get out, and you got there by your choices, one purchase after another after another. It happens very subtly. And by the way, the credit card companies love your business. I want you to know that. And so, can you make, we need God to give us a sense. That's why the psalmist in the conclusion says, Lord, you lead me in the way of the ever lasting because I don't walk that way. I need someone to lead me. How many of you are glad he leads me? He leads me. Amen. Praise God he does. And so think about that. You can make some choices to get healthy. Yesterday uh, we had, uh, my wife and I are growing a garden and it's the really, I think the first time I participated to this degree. But I'm getting really excited. We actually, uh, in our square foot garden that we have, it's all, we make it simple, stupid, 
you know, that kind of thing for somebody like me, but in this foot square is this, and this foot square is that, and that foot square. And the lettuce came up, and it was absolutely beautiful, green and red. And we put it on some, we had some turkey burgers, aren't we healthy? <laughs> and we put that lettuce on there, and I got to tell you what, a guy had invented a thing called the brisk meter. Did you know what a brisk meter is? See, that's why you come to church, to learn stuff like this. You never learn. A brisk meter. I didn't know what it was until yesterday. It's a thing you put into a fruit or plant, and it tells you how much sugar is in it. And I mean natural sugar, not the refined stuff, the natural sugar that's in there. And this is what he did. He took the produce from the supermarket. He took produce from organically grown, and then he took produce that he grew in his backyard. It measures really just how good that that fruit is. Guess which by far registered the highest on the brisk meter every time? Somebody tell me. The stuff he grew in his backyard. You go and pick it, you put it on a plate, and you eat it. And it's delicious. Did we make the choice to grow a garden? Yes, we did. Is it a lot of work? Yes, it is. Can we do that? During wartime, they tell me people had what they used to call victory gardens. But we're too sophisticated for that, aren't we now? We want to go in. I went yesterday to get, I don't eat ice cream anymore because of these big changes in my life. I eat low-fat yogurt. On the way to low-fat yogurt to get a gallon of it, I passed through the bakery section of a certain store. Guess what I saw? Everything your mind could imagine. I mean, I can't believe it. There were cakes and cookies, and some of them had stripes on them, and some of them had raisins in them, and some of them had dates, and some of them had sugar coating. And it, I mean, it was a, a field of baked goods. And do you think that I hungered or desired any of those? Yeah, I did, as a matter of fact. But the fact is, I made it to my, and I thought, man, all, one of the things that we're learning, if, if it comes from a plant, you should eat it. If it's made in a plant, <laughs> you don't know where that stuff's been, brother and sister. Just because they put a label on it, doesn't it make sense grow it in your backyard? You know what went into that. Is that a choice? Yeah, it is. If I want better health, i got to do something about it. Is the doctor going to do it for me? Is the doctor or the nurse going to do it for you? No. You have to make that choice. If you want a healthier lifestyle, guess what? It's yours. And I'm not saying you can get rid of everything that you have, but the fact is, can't you make it a little bit better? Can't you make it a little bit healthier and say, yes, Pastor, we can Go like that. Yes, Pastor, we can. And some of you already are. And I'm hearing amazing testimonies around the church about what God is doing. It's just really cool. People have lost weight. People have more energy. It's just like we were told. But this is the bottom line. It's just common sense. That's why we need this. God, please give me the common sense to do what I know that is just good for me, right for me. Those kind of things. Next thing is this. I can choose to deepen my relationships. If I want relationships and I want to have deeper relationships, what's stopping me? Oh, I don't have time. I don't have this. And they're connected. I was talking with one of the brothers, won't mention his name. Wendell, do I have permission to share your story? Can I do that? Because I said I had to, I, we have a confidentiality thing and I have to ask. So I'm asking in front, of, in front of 300 people, I'm asking, or 200 people, whatever it is. So I'm asking. This is what he said. This is so cool. He's, he's doing the thing where instead of having coffee in the morning, he has water and lemon juice. Believing that it's like a battery kind of thing and, you know, you, you can do that and it, and it kind of gets you going, which is really great. I haven't tried it yet, but I want to and I'm going to. But he said, you know, I, I got up this morning very early, had very little sleep. He's a farmer. 
And he said, and my energy was running low. So he said, I think I'm going to head for the thermos of coffee, which he had gotten kind of away from to wake himself up. Six, seven cups of coffee a day, get you going, keep you going. We've talked about that before. He said, the funny thing is, he said, uh, I went back to the house and my wife was awake and she was there. And I spent a little time with my wife. He said, then I went back with my thermos of coffee. It was too hot for me to drink. And I said to myself, I don't need it anymore. And he said, I think it was her. <laughs> and you know, that's exactly what I read this week. Did you know that when you're in a good, healthy relationship with someone else, when you're around that person or near that person, there is a chemical that is released in your body called oxytonin. Did any of you know that? I didn't know that. It's the same chemical that when a mother has a baby, guess what happens when the two of those bond, bond together? And I'm glad God did this because I've been in the room when the baby's born with my wife and close to with some other individuals. And I'm telling you, those ladies are not having a fun time when they're having the baby. I'm telling you. I've seen some ladies that wouldn't say boo to you, but they will scream when they are in labor and say other things. Uh, especially to their husband uh, at that time. That you did this to me, you know, it's your fault. You get down here, do what I'm doing. Uh, but when that baby's born, what does God do? He brings that baby, and it's so beautiful, isn't it? After the labor is over, they bring that baby, and there are chemicals released in the mother and in the baby. I didn't know this. And the two of them bond. And so... I think oxytonin in good relationships is a whole lot better than a lot of other things you could put in your system. So folks, if good relationships are good for us, then what should we do? Another, not a hard thing to figure out, not rocket science here, I need to cultivate what? Some good relationships for me. And as a matter of fact, aren't you glad that God made the church? There's enough oxytonin in this room today to get us all feeling better. Praise God. Have you ever wondered why when you come to church, most people do feel better when they leave than when they came in? There's something going on around here. I think God knew about this a long time ago. Don't you? I think it's great. It's a wonderful thing. I'm having so much fun, I can't stand it. Let love be your highest goal. Love's good for us. Love's good for us. It really is. Now, some of you say, well, they haven't been good to me because I've been rejected and I've been hurt in relationships. Yeah, that's a possibility. And uh, I want to give you a little clue. Sometimes when you go and you think in your mind, I just got to have that person's love, guess what? Because they have a choice, you can't make them love you. Have you ever noticed that? And what I tell people is, is that you keep wanting that love to come from this particular place. Have you ever heard the statement, you can't get blood out of a stone? I don't know if that's biblical or not, but there is some truth to that. And what I would encourage you to do is, don't try to let your love come from a certain place with this expectation. When you put expectations on people, guess what's going to happen? Love is what? It's free. It's not coerced. It can't be bought. Real love. And so this is what I would ask you to do. Would you think that if you keep wanting to get love out of this person, love out of this person, love out of this person, it doesn't come, maybe God is saying is, why don't you take some of that love and why don't you redirect it? Not in a way that is not healthy. And I just want to ask you, do you think that there are some kids in this church that could use your love and attention? Do you think there are? Behind the doors of this church right now, there's a bunch of children back there. Do you think that they would benefit by your love? The answer is yes, okay? Uh, they would, okay? Do you think there are some people in this room this morning how many of you, and don't be embarrassed, but how many of you like to be loved by another person? Go ahead, raise your hand. How many of you need love? I need it. You need it. Do you think this morning that you can go and share 
your love, God's love, with another person in this room, and you know there's a good chance that they just might be the one to give you some love back. So think about your relationships. And God gave us his great family. I love the church, don't you? I love the church. I love brothers and sisters in Christ. God created this family for us. It's it's so important. And I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts as you trust him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. So I'm going to love you. And you're going to love me. And that love should flow between us. And it's great to be in a place. I don't care if you're single here. Some of you are really saying, you know, I think the only thing for me is marriage. I'm disappointed. I've never been married. Well, I'm going to tell you. I know some people that are married and they went through some very difficult times. And what they thought was going to really bring them life didn't. You can't get your life out of another person. Can you say amen? You just can't. But in loving God, Will God love you back? Yes, he will. So we got God, we got each other, and we got this wonderful thing called, am I accepted by God? God? Am I loved by God? Am I a part of his family? So uh, one of the things that will help you in this area of your life is, in relationships, is this. We tend to sometimes really be self-absorbed. Is that the best way for me to say that? We keep thinking what I need, what I want, what my desires are, what my preferences are. And when you're trying especially to relate to other people in a healthy way, do you know that is very self-defeating for you to continually think about you, what I want, what I need? And this is what I'm going to ask you to do. It's a revolutionary concept. Why don't you get your mind off of yourself? I just want that to hang there. Why don't you get your mind off of yourself, your goals, your dreams, your accomplishments, your pains, your aches, your desires, and why don't you take that mind that God has given you and put it on someone else and think about their needs, their wants, their desires, their pains. And when you minister to someone else, guess what amazingly happens to you when you get your mind off of you most of the time? You're going to forget about your pains. You're going to forget about your aches. And God's going to give you something a whole lot better. He's going to give you a sense of satisfaction that you reached out to someone else in need. So let's, let's love one another. And then finally this. Uh, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Don't let the fear of rejection or retaliation Stop you from loving. I can choose to trust God no matter what happens in my life. I can make that choice to be all that God wanted me to be. Do some of us have handicaps? Do some of us have troubles? Yes, we do. Do some of us have bad self-talk? Yes, we do. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us, believers in harmony with God's own will, and we know that God causes everything to work together for, let's say this together, everything to work together for good of those who love God. We got a little misspelling there. I know some of you picked that up. But uh, together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn with many brothers and sisters. So I can choose how I relate to what has happened to me. So I can choose, notice this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. If the cars break down, can I still praise God? If the refrigerator is not full, can I still praise God? If I am not getting along with a person that I'd like to get along with, can I still praise God? 
If I have some pain in my body, can I still choose to praise God? What's the other option? I can choose what I think about. And I think this is very, very interesting. Very interesting. This is what Scripture says. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. It has been taught that you can't change your brain. In 2002, there was a man, can't remember his name, but he won a Nobel Peace Prize, or prize, excuse me, for proving that to be false. He was a neurosurgeon. What they believed is, and this is how it happens, your brain is kind of like clay. Did you know that? Some of you said, I knew that about you, Pastor. <laughs> but at least there's one there. And what happens is, is when you think it sends an electrical current across your brain. Pay attention to this. This is real important, okay? So when you think it sends electrical, when that electrical current goes across your brain, guess what it does? It makes a little bit of an indentation in your brain. It makes like a pathway, is what they tell me. Now, if you think the same thought again, guess what happens? That same current fires and goes across the same area, and guess what it does? It presses it a little bit deeper. And then if you think that same thought again, then it sends that current across that same area. And what you have is that you get a little crack that was a crevice that becomes a canyon in your mind. That's why it's so difficult for us to break out. They call that our brain begins to form patterns in our mind and in our way of thinking. But what this neurosurgeon discovered was is that they told us before that can't be changed. But the neurosurgeon no, it, it can be. As a matter of fact, there was a young man who was in our Bible college, got in a terrible accident, went through the windshield, almost took the top of his head off. When he lived and came through, his personality was actually different. It was remarkable, the change in him. Do you know why? Because when he went through that windshield, it did a number to his brain. But the fact is, is how can I change my brain? And I'm going to tell you, it's a choice. How many of you want to change your brain? How many of you want to get out of some of the ruts? When we say, you're in a rut, what are we talking about? It's in your mind, it affects your heart, you got into something that you're going over and over and over and over again. And here is the secret. If you begin thinking on other things more and more, guess what happens? You stop thinking about some of those things, and you start thinking about other things, guess what happens? Anybody know? You start forming some new channels, new pathways. I'm really interested in this. It's almost like I can be reprogrammed. And I want to read to you what Philippians says, and then I'm going to tie this up. This is what it says. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always, in Philippians. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Can we have anxious thoughts? But in everything by prayer and petition, is prayer good for your brain? Yeah, it is. With thanksgiving. So if I have a negative mind, if I have an anxious mind, and I begin praying and talking to God over and over and over again, but I do that with a heart of gratefulness, I do that with a heart of thanksgiving, well, that's what's going to start happening in my mind. It's going to start changing for the better. Present your sense to God and the peace of God. Where does peace come? We say it's in our heart. Really, it's in your head. It works its way to your heart, your mind, your will, which transcends all understanding. Will guard your hearts, look what the Scripture says, your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is a big deal. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, 
whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what does the Scripture say? Think about such things. Now, how many of you want to have that impressed upon your mind? That it's there when you wake up in the morning. And it's there when you go through the circumstances of your day. And it will literally change your life. How many of you are grateful for the truth of God? How many of you had already transformed your life and your person? You could have been very different. You could have been a victor, victim, but instead you are a victor in Christ Jesus. And we should be so excited about the potential. What's that mean? Can I change? Can you change for the better? Yes, we can. And it's there and it's ours, but we need to choose it. And are you and I willing to choose it? And then you need this last little thing. I can choose Jesus as my Savior. The point is, is that we call him a savior. Why do we call Jesus a savior? Does anybody know? Why do we call him a savior? What do saviors do? They save. And we call Jesus a savior. The Bible says that he saves us from our sin. How many of you are grateful for that this morning? He saves us from our sin. He saves us from, from separation from God for eternity. He's a savior. Can God save me? I wrote this down from my chemistry. Can Jesus the Savior who died on a cross 2,000 years ago and arose again on the third day appear to many, many people as at the right hand of God? Can he save me from my connections? Can he save me from my circumstances? Can he save me from my consciousness? And can he help me with my choices? And I believe he can. And I want to offer you today as I close this morning, will you take Jesus to be your Savior? For him to come into your life. And if you don't know him personally, if you've never given your life to him, today is the day of salvation. He can save you from your past. And he can give you brand new life. And he can, only he, can help you to become the person that God really wants you to be. So let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time in the Word this morning. Thank you for the things that we have learned. Right now, we are thinking. Maybe some of us are thinking. The pastor took a long time. But pastor, uh, Father, we came to hear from you and not from him. And so this morning, we have, and we can all identify with, Father, the fact is, is that we do have these factors that have shaped us in many ways. And the scripture says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world any longer, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind in Christ Jesus. This is taking on real new meaning to me. I am so glad that neurosurgeons are finally catching up with you in the Bible. And Father, I pray if there's anyone here hungering for life, in its abundance, Father, touching every area of their life. I pray today will be the day of salvation. And Lord, there's a, a child of God here who has been hampered, hindered, held back by these other factors. You have given him a great gift and the power of choice. And that power only comes from you. How they need you, how we need you today. And Lord, whatever a decision a person makes this morning, and I pray they will, I pray it just will not be an exercise of spending time and gathering more information today, Father, but that truly we will turn to you. Save us, our Savior. Save us from ourselves and to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand, if you would.